Okay, you're listening to IELTS FM on 103. This is Ennis Morrison. And my featured artist tonight is Julian Cope. Up here at the moment, seemingly uh, filming stone circles and stuff like that. If you just come and see what's going on in Britain, in this big island, it's kind of empowering to realize that it's on your doorstep. That we don't have to drive across America to uh, achieve our inner self. I came out of punk, and punk was taught to sort of diss everything um, to do with hippies, and Stonehenge was to do with hippies. So I was one of those who came to mock and remain to pray. You know, I went to Stonehenge this one day with my mother-in-law, and she said, darling, when was this done? And I told her the date. I said it was about 2,000 years before Christ. Wow, that's just amazing. It's physically so impressive. And I thought, wow, and I suddenly saw it through her eyes. And I was suddenly impressed by it. And we came to Avebury and flipped out that there was this stuff, these kind of, you know, pre-roofed temples lying around on the landscape of Britain. And so my mind started thinking, wow, we've really been brought up to diss where we're where we are. If you spend your whole life thinking, oh, I can't wait to get away to Ibiza, then you're not gonna look close by. Everything I do is from a rock and roll angle. And I want to explain through my actions that rock and roll didn't start off as an excuse for sloth. It started off because people were forward thinking mofos. And I want to turn it around for that very reason. Yeah, I rock. <laughs> So I took eight years to research and write my book on these first temples. I visited over 500 sites because it's essential to see what the ancients were seeing. I also wanted to let people know what's out there. So now we're going to compress all that research into two weeks on the road. The whole point of Land's End is that it was never Romanized. It belongs to the part of Britain that I term beyond Rome. We are taught to believe the Romans came and cured us, cured us of our barbarian ways. I think that lifting that lid is the hardest thing. But once you've lifted that lid, then all this information starts scurrying out. And in terms of the mythology of, uh, of Britain, it's, um, it's something that can then enrich our lives. We're at Tune Coit, and Tune Coit is a dolmen, the smallest dolmen, but the most beautiful of all. A dolmen is a kind of uh, a megalithic or great stone box with a large capstone on top. Um, dates back about mm, four and a half, five thousand years, um, and it's a phenomenon that you find all over Cornwall. You find all over. West Wales, parts of South Wales, and a lot in Ireland. But elsewhere, you don't really see them. You see some in Brittany, but um, this is where you find the best ones. People have to think of Tune Coit as being the megalithic mushroom, and I think really uh, it's the one that looks most like it. It's, um, it's so much smaller than the others. It's really hard, you can squeeze in here, but even that's difficult. First thing that this says to me is free time. You don't spend any time building this unless you've got free time. This is a culture which has grappled and finally grasped uh, some kind of control away from the earth and is now standing proud in itself and saying, hey, we exist as well. I would imagine that Tune Coit was used um, for all kinds of different rituals. Most of those are lost to us. I think that you can spend your life conjecturing. It's very easy to get new age about things like this. But uh, the most important thing is the fact that this thing still exists. There are so few of them, and we're here just to celebrate the fact that it's still here.
I'm walking into the middle of Boscow and Un stone circle. I think it's the greatest stone circle on the Land's End Peninsula. And I'm walking right up to the center. What makes it the greatest is its position almost at the Land's End. And the fact that it has this huge monolith leaning at the very center. The stone circle was entirely enclosed by gorse until last summer solstice where it was all cleared back because so many people visit here on the summer solstice. But this is probably the most living site in the whole of Land's End, maybe one of the most living sites in the whole of Britain. I don't think any casual tourists come here. I just don't think they find it. It's just off the A30, but there's no sign. And as one crusty once said to me, people don't go anywhere nowadays unless there's a sign. Day two, the land's end. I feel good. <laughs> it's 4 a.m. It's not really. Today we're going to go to Bole Fugu, also at the land's end. And then we're zooming off to, uh, we're going from the West Penwith Peninsula to Penrith Travel Lodge. So this is where they were excavating here? Yes. Bole Fugu is in Joe May's garden, and we're here to explore how, here at the Land's End, Neolithic ritual lingered into the later prehistoric times. Colin, you two, I can't believe it, and you white trainers. Yeah. <laughs> Fugu's. Fugu's an underground chamber which you find in Cornwall, which people who haven't traveled tend to confuse with souterrains, which are other underground chambers, which you find in Ireland, in Brittany, in Scotland. But Fugus have a seemingly different function. So this is Ian Cook, Hello. who's a Fugu obsessive and has written a fantastic book called Mother and Son. Yes, you and yeah. Are you suggesting this was some kind of religious shrine to the fruits of the earth? Yeah, I think that's a very fair remark. I would, yeah. I would certainly suggest that, yes. Yeah, I think I all like the evidence goes... Yes, I do, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it's got, it makes far more sense than ideas of um, refuge and storing um, yeah. bits of meat and whatever. Totally ludicrous. Yeah, so many people think that there's storage involved here, but, I mean, we're all up to our ankles in water. Mm. Uh, give us some examples of things that go on here. Now, Joe. Well, people use this for private meditation. Uh, we bring groups in here sometimes, depending mm. on the kind of workshop, uh, where we might do um, ceremonies of various kinds. But in a sense, the fugu is actually much longer than it appears in this reality, but that, that it's possible to journey in another reality mm. even further. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've indeed used it like that. And it does seem, this is like a, a gateway, it's a portal. This is just the airlock <laughs> before you go from yeah. this reality, woo. It's a, a powerful image, a, a big, mighty passage like this going mm. into the earth that it's very easy to project our own interpretations onto that. So I'm coming at this from the perspective of being a psychologist and a psychotherapist, mm. running a centre here where people come and do inner work, mm. and I can relate to this passage in, in those kinds Absolutely. of terms. Yeah. And other people coming from different perspectives would have their own, I think, perfectly mm. valid um, use and interpretation of what's going on here. I'm glad we got to do this because I, I was thinking that, um, that we wouldn't get to do a fugu. Yeah. And um, it's definitely worked out well. Oh, good.